This episode of Let's Argue About Plants is brought to you by Bluestone Perennials, a second-generation, nationally-renowned mail-order nursery. Bluestone offers thousands of varieties of perennials, grasses, ground covers, and shrubs for shipment throughout the U.S. All plants are grown in natural fiber, biodegradable pots that plant directly into the soil. All plants are 100% guaranteed to grow. Visit bluestoneperennials.com today. Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who love plants, but not always the same ones. I'm Carol Collins, Associate Editor at Fine Gardening Magazine, and today I'm joined by Jay Sifford, an award-winning landscape designer based in North Carolina. Several of Jay's designs have been featured in Fine Gardening over the years, and we'll drop links of those articles as well as some photos into the show notes. Welcome to the podcast, Jay. Thanks, Carol. It's good to be here. I was wondering if you could begin by telling us a little bit about your earliest memories of plants and gardening. And were there any pivotal experiences in your in your life that brought you toward this life of designing and working with plants? Well, my earliest memory would be picking strawberries with my grandmother in her backyard when I was about four years old. And um she kind of had some blue hair. You know, when some women get older, their hair turns from white to blue. And so she had all these petunias in the front of her uh, of her house that pretty much matched her hair. So as a kid, that I thought that was really funny. Um, I also used to grow roses by the time I was like 10 years old, grandifloras and tiber teas and that sort of thing. I don't like them anymore, but um, I grew them then and had my uh, my favorites, of course. And uh, when I was a kid, I was sort of a loner and I would go out in the woods and I would look at the texture of the bark on the big oak trees and watch the squirrels run up and down. And I just thought trees and plants in general were very fascinating um, when I was a kid. And then I had a room full of orchids when I was about 14 and um, really appreciated them and went to a flower show and saw these beautiful design orchid gardens. And one day I'd love to do that which I actually did. But what I found out is that I love design. I love arranging plants in the ground. So pots of orchids on the shelves of greenhouses kind of lost um, intrigue for me over the time. And so now I no longer do that. But I love to dig in the dirt and I love to design beautiful spaces for people. Very cool. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about your design and horticulture education? I am totally self-taught. I think... Uh, I've read a lot, obviously, and I have some mentors um, that I think is a really important thing to have. Um, But I think past a certain point, you either have an eye for design or you don't. And I'm blessed or cursed. I tend to think 80 percent of the time it's a blessing that I do have that uh, that eye for design. Uh, 20 percent when it's not is I'm lying awake at three o'clock in the morning designing in my head. It's not good. And I'm supposed to be sleeping at three. I bet that happens to everyone, though, right? <laughs> um, so w- if someone was just starting out and said, I want to be like J- Jay Sifford when I grow up, would you recommend a similar, you know, self-taught approach? Or do you think there's value in education, you know, going to school for this type of thing? What do you think? Um, <clears throat> if somebody wants to be just like Jay Sifford, that's a really scary thing. I don't know that the world can handle two of me. But I think um, education is obviously good. Um, I decided a long time ago I didn't want to be a landscape architect because most of those that I know end up designing parking lots and drainage systems, and that wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, But there are some really good courses, especially in England, and I think you can access those online, um, you know, sign up and pay the tuition for those. And looking back on it, that's probably what I would do if I were starting out today. Um, But I think mentoring, as I said before, is so important. So it would be really good for somebody who's just kind of getting into the business to find somebody that really clicks with their style and their personality and just suck up to them and uh, learn all you can from them. That's probably the best way to get started. And of course, reading and attending seminars and symposiums, reading fine gardening magazines, always good too. Uh, (laughs) A lot of things you can do uh, besides go to school, but I think I would do one of those online courses if I had to do it over again. 
Excellent. I imagine people must tell you all the time that being a full-time gardening designer is their dream job, um, but I'm guessing it's not as glamorous as they imagine. What does a typical work day look like for you? Well, last time I thought it was glamorous was when I was um, stepping back to look at a design and didn't realize that there was a lake bank right there and fell backwards into a whole lot of mud. So that was one of my more glamorous moments as of late. But uh, getting back to my normal work day, um, I do have a crew of six people, which I couldn't work without them. But sometimes the running of the business part gets me down a little bit. So I wake up at six, I do my emails, um, and then I usually do my site visits between 8 and 8.30 for as long as I need to. And then I have my appointments with potential clients. Um, and hopefully there's a little bit of time a day where I can squeeze in uh, some design work because that's what people hire me to do. Yeah. Do you design on paper, on the computer? How, how is your I process? I on paper. I'm old school. I really like the tactile experience of holding pencils and pens and, and having paper. Um, I draw to scale, but it is hand-drawn. Oh, very cool. And how many how many projects do you typically have going at the same time in various stages mm-hmm. of completion? We work almost always just one project at a time. And I'll tell you why. I think if people are uh, entrusting us with their money and their most personal spaces, they deserve my undivided attention. So unless we're having to wait on some materials, we just do one at a time. Um, I've been the recipient of some home remodelers in the past who, you know, were doing four jobs at a time and they'd show up on Friday to collect a check. But um, that's about the only time I saw them. And I don't want to treat my clients like that. I tell my clients that if we meet your expectations, then we've totally failed. You know, my goal is to vastly exceed any expectations that people have for their spaces. And um, usually that's the way it turns out. Very cool. Okay, this is a cool open-ended question. What is a garden to you? Well, I think a garden is a place that's set apart from the rest of the world. I think that a garden is much more than a collection of plants, and we might talk about that a little bit later. I think a garden is a place where um, fantasy and reality can collide, and that sets the imagination free. And since we're talking about inspiration today, inspiration and imagination are bedmates, basically. Um, And I think a garden is a place where you can lose yourself and then find yourself again. Hopefully, a better version of yourself is what you find. And I know when I go to the mountain house, which is what I'll be doing after this, I always lose myself. Um, sometimes it takes me a while to find myself. Sometimes it's just a couple minutes. It kind of depends on my week. But I think a garden is that stylized version of nature where you can lose yourself. And I do say stylized because um, we design gardens in a way that um, our, the garden design is filtered through our brains based on our experiences, our aesthetics, you know, our favorite colors, that kind of thing. So it's really not nature. Um, it contains nature. And nature in the form of pollinators is usually the beneficiary of it. But it is a stylized version of nature. It's how we see nature and organize it in our brains in an orderly way. Very good. Um, that's that's. I, that's a lot to think about, but I, I love that take on gardening. And I think a lot of people that are listening are probably nodding along because a lot well, of us like go in the garden to lose ourselves. Yeah, I think, you know, pollinators don't care if you scatter seeds randomly or not. Um, but we care, you know, if we're not comfortable in a space, if we can't process a space mentally, uh, we're not going to spend time there because we won't be comfortable. And in order to spend time in a space, you want to feel comfortable. And so that's what a good version of stylization can do. Oh, very good. You did a feature article for us in 2019 um, based around this concept that you refer to as meaningful juxtaposition. And if I understand it correctly, Mm -hmm. you identified four parameters, size, shape, color, and texture, and proposed that in a cohesive design, some of these parameters will match or coordinate with each other and Uh, be consistent with each other, and some should be varied. Can you tell us a little bit more about this idea and how it plays into your design practice? Sure, sure. It's one of the uh, most meaningful things I've discovered over the years, and I think that if I could um, get people to understand and utilize this, uh, 
I've done a, a good day's work. So again, there are four parameters, I think. Everything in the world has these four parameters, whether they're me or you or the chair I'm sitting in, uh, the car I drive, um, pretty much anything, my computer, you know, they all have size, shape, color, and texture. So in uh, a garden incident, I think uh, you can start by matching two of those things, size and shape, for example, um, color and texture, you might vary a little bit. If you match two of them as a starting point, you'll have enough commonality to hold the vignette together, but enough disparity to make it interesting and, and introduce just a slight bit of tension into that. So if everything matches, it's kind of like you went to a big box furniture store, bought a whole house full of furniture in an hour. You know, everything is matchy matchy, which I say is boring, boring. Um, and you don't want to do that. If, if nothing uh, matches with regard to those four parameters, it's kind of like you went to a big box nursery and, um, you know, bought a bunch of half dead plants off the sale rack. Um, it's just chaotic. And again, uh, it gets back to being stylized, uh, you know, your garden being stylized. So if you start by matching two of those and varying the others, I think you're off to a good start. Sometimes if it's still a little matchy, you can vary the third thing. Or if it's not quite matchy enough, you can you, you can take one out and match three. But um, two and two is a good place to start. It gives you enough interest, um, but enough commonality to hold it together. That's great. And anybody like I love how it simplifies, you know, aspect of the design process that anybody could do this and anybody could understand. And then once you hear this idea, you start seeing it in really good designs. <laughs> um, good. So in issue 209, you gave us an inside look into the process of designing your mountain garden. And before we go get too much further, um, I understand that you have two gardens. You have a city garden and then you have one in the mountains. Can you sort of give us the lay of the land on those two gardens? Well, the city garden uh, is in a townhome courtyard. I have about 50 square feet out front I can plant, but everything in the courtyard is is pretty much in, in pots. It's extremely contemporary. Um, I like black. I have black dogs. The mountain house is black. I actually painted the walls and the brick um, black back there, and then I had to buy retractable shades so everything wouldn't burn up when it attracted afternoon heat. Um, but it's, it's very contemporary. I have some blown glass. I've got some bamboo back there. Um, and it's all in 300 square feet, which I look at that and realize that you can do so much with such a small space. It's kind of mind boggling at times. So that is my city garden. And then, of course, the mountain garden is a stylized meadow that was in the magazine. Uh, the front of that, the stylized meadow area is full sun. And then I do have a shade area with two natural bogs and a stream in the back. One one thing that I found really fascinating about the mountain garden is that um, the, you had a lot of site constraints. There's this sensitive woodland wetland in the back, which had to be uh, protected. And so basically your your main garden is in the front, but that front gu front garden also had to accommodate your septic system and a vegetative berm to direct water away from the septic system. Um, but despite those constraints, you you made this beautiful, immersive, meadow, stylized meadow. And I was wondering, uh, you know, what are some of the keys to success when creating a naturalistic design when there are so many constraints? I think sometimes uh, constraints are good because they force you to come up with imaginative ideas. Um, it's It wasn't exactly uh, my first idea about how to form that garden. I was going to do a raised boardwalk through the woods and that sort of thing in the front, but then we cut down the trees to uh, make uh, room for the septic drain line. So it started all over again. Um, I think the first thing, if you're building near a septic field, I do need to say this, uh, you need to know what kind of pipes you have. Uh, the older ones are like PVC and sand. You really can't plant anything um, in areas like that. But I have a newer version, which are a little bit more resistant to uh, root growth. Uh, so it's, and I know exactly where the pipes are. So that's good. Um, I did also plant a lot of shallow rooted 
plants. You know, I wouldn't plant panicum and I do have some panicum or switchgrass there, but it's away from the septic lines because that stuff can have eight to 10 foot tap root, which is not really awesome in a septic field. So you have to be really attentive to roots. And there is amazingly little information on that on the internet. And a lot of it contradicts each other. Go figure. That's usually how the internet works, I think. Um, but yeah, first know, uh, about your septic field if you're building on a septic field. Uh, second thing I think is really important, and I, and I tried to do in that garden, is to tell the story of the land. You know, I believe that, and we'll get to this a little bit later, um, there are four cornerstones and, and to a great garden, and a story is one of those. So that area up there is highly agricultural. So I thought the meadow would be good because there are some meadows that are not stylized but natural um, around the area. And Ash County, North Carolina, is also the Christmas tree capital of the world. So it gave me the opportunity to tell that story through the conifers that I really, really love. Um, and then the other thing I'd like to say about it really is um, the power of masses. You know, you can plant one or two of something. Say you're going to plant ferns. These people, um, I don't know, they kind of irritate me a little bit. Oh, I just bought two ferns today. I'm like, well, where are the other 498? You know, why not plant 500 instead of two? Because we read 500 individual plants of the same kind as uh, one entity, not 500 little entities. So you can plant a lot of something and still have that simplistic uh, sort of um, minimalistic but not sparse type of garden. And I think everybody wants to feel tranquil um, in their garden. I also think that... Um, up there, it was really important to provide year-round interest because the winters can be long and they can be cold up there. Uh, and so in the Charlotte area where I work, uh, we don't have to really deal so much with winter interest because our winters are pretty short here. Um, and then the other thing I learned that I like to say, um, I get inspiration from everywhere. And so I was at a steakhouse and they have this huge lemon cake. It must have 15 layers in it. it takes like three days to eat it you know, eat, eat the piece of cake. But I realized I'm looking at that cake and I'm like, this is how great garden should be built layer upon layer upon layer. And all the layers relate to the other layers. So you have kinetic movement from the wind, you have texture, you have color, you have form. And on all these things layer up on each other, I think to really make a big old layer cake of a beautiful garden. Well, yes. And, and that's the opposite of the, the person that buys two ferns and sticks them in the ground and surrounds it with mulch. Nature, nature makes layers. So mm -hmm. it makes sense that a naturalistic garden would have layers too. Yeah, I tell people there is the difference between minimalistic and sparse. You know, sparse is you plant one thing and then you have um, three feet before the next thing and you just have a lot of mulch. Tell my clients, if they want to see mulch, go to the big box stores. They have bags and bags and bags of it, but you're not going to find a lot of mulch in my areas uh, or my gardens, except for up closer to the house where it's a little bit more important to look a little bit tidier. Let nature do its thing, and then you have to edit and corral, uh, corral it back in a little bit uh, to keep it stylized over the long period of time. Do you Does your team provide uh, maintenance after the design is complete, um, or is the, the homeowner going to be responsible for the, the maintenance? It usually? depends. We, we, I do have a staff gardener, and so we do maintenance for some people uh, who really want that or need that. A lot of people take pride in their gardens and like to get out there like you and I probably do and, um, and weed and, and look around, you know, walk through the garden with a glass of wine. And, and when you're up close to plants like that, you really can spot any potential problems, um, hopefully before they get to be big problems. But yes, we do provide that for some people. Oh, yes. Very cool. Um, in your most recent cover story, uh, it was in our Febu February 2024 issue. Uh, you had several stream dry stream bed designs. And I must admit, we, we do this meeting called Heads and Decks, where we decide on the headlines. And then the deck is the little subtitle that goes with each title of an article. And so it was proposed that the, the deck, the subtitle, would include the word essential. And I said in this meeting, convince me that a dry stream bed is an essential element in a garden. And boy, when I read the article, I was convinced. But if could you tell us a little bit more how a dry stream bed could function in a garden design? Sure. 
Uh, you know, nowadays they're building houses like 10 feet apart, at least in my area of the country. And when I first started about 20 years ago, uh, runoff was not a really big problem. Erosion wasn't a big problem in a lot of gardens. Now everybody has issues because everybody's putting their water towards somebody else's property. Houses are too close together. The soil stratification has been disturbed, so it doesn't perk properly. There are a lot of issues like that. So I think that um, a lot of mun municipalities really reward homeowners for keeping water on their property instead of sending it into the storm drains. So that's one good reason uh, to have a dry creek bed. You can funnel the creek bed into um, a rain garden, for example, um, and that's a whole nother, another topic. But um, they're very functional. You know, hook some all your downspouts to um, black French drain pipe and just send it into the uh, creek bed. And it's also a beautiful thing. The way we build them is different. A lot of people just uh, dig a trench, throw down some rocks that all look the same, call it a creek bed. I call that a drainage ditch. Uh, the way we do creek beds is we use a minimum of four different kinds of rocks, big boulders, smaller boulders, big river rocks, smaller river rocks. And we really curve them, as the article talked about, to uh, simulate a real stream. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to love to go up to the mountains and, and look at streams and study how water flowed. And so when I was training my employees on how to do this, I told them, you have to become the water. You have to become the water um, in order to understand how it moves, how it flows, where it wants to go, where it doesn't want to go, that sort of thing. So if you make a realistic dry creek bed, it's a perfect focal point to build a beautiful garden around. So I think creek beds are both functional and aesthetic if they're designed properly. And yeah, and it's like, you know, like that hint of nature, that naturalistic vibe that is that runs through all of your designs. Um, I, I have a question for you. So we don't often get a chance to answer or read our questions, except when we do a Q&A episode. But we got a question by email uh, right before that we were going to do this show. So Jeff, and I think this is one that, that you can address. Jeff from Kentucky wrote to ask how to maintain an attractive garden with pets. And I know you have dogs and you have clients mm -hmm. with dogs, but Jeff is wondering, are there certain types of fencing that work best or tough plants that you would always use in a pet friendly garden? And any design strategies to prevent trampling or damage from pet waste. So he said any advice that you could give would be greatly appreciated. And Jeff is a newer gardener. Okay. Well, we can't make moats like you'd find at the zoo. Uh, so, so that's out. And a lot of it depends on what kind of pet it is. If it's a cat, all bets are off. If it's a dog, you know, your strategy might be different with a chihuahua than it would be with the Great Dane. But I can give a few overall pointers. Um, you can probably train your dog over time to go to one area, um, which is worth trying. I think also something I try to do with clients, some I can talk them into it, some I can't. But gravel is your friend. Turf is your enemy because no matter how beautiful your turf is, six months from now, it's going to have little yellow spots all over it. And it's not going to look good. Um, but uh, one of the photos that I sent you is of a very wide gravel path with lush, immersive beds on either side. So if you can use gravel, if it's in your aesthetic, I think you should. Actually, the clients for the photo that I sent, um, they had three Australian shepherds and the lawn was just, it was just torched. And the husband and I wanted to do the gravel. The wife, oh, my dogs need um, turf. You know, they need grass. And uh, she became quite emotional about it, but finally she gave in and she said, you know, it's so easy to clean up and the dogs love it. They skid out in it and play in it. And it was a great thing. Um, let's face it. If some dog pees or poops on the gravel, it's not going to hurt anything. And I think if you have that as negative space, it can also really make a beautiful garden. And then that gives you the opportunity to really, um, I don't want to say crowd plants into the beds, but make the plants in the bed a little bit closer together, again, with plant health in mind, so that the dogs can't easily get into that area. There aren't any really good fences, I don't think, that you can use. If it's a chihuahua, you could use those little foot-tall fences that you can buy at the store. Um, but I think 
training your dog to go in a certain place and um, limiting the amount of turf you have and then planting your beds fully to keep the dogs from going in there. Some of the grasses are um, very uh, dog urine tolerant unless they go in the same spot every day. Thing with using grasses, if you're using the tall grasses and you live in an area with a lot of ticks, that might be an issue for you. The junipers are very tough and they can be just prickly enough sometimes to keep dogs from, from going into the beds and lying on them. So that's all I can tell you on that. <laughs> dogs are going to do what they want to do, but if you, yeah, if you can think of a few ways to keep them, yeah, the, the limiting turf sounds like a good place to start. Yeah. I have heard that you collect fine art and have some very unusual and exciting pieces in your collection. And I was wondering if the process of curating your personal collection and living with your art has an impact on your uh, design, garden design process. And were there any or are there any ideas that are in your designs that have come from or been inspired by art? Sure. I collect collect contemporary and abstract art. And if you think about abstract paintings, usually they're sort of big blocks or swaths of, of bright colors. And so I think that really did influence my style uh, for garden design. Uh, I'm basically a block planter as opposed to a matrix planter. I'll tell you the difference. Block planting is when you plant a big group of one thing, or maybe you blur the lines a little bit with a second type of plant. Matrix planting, you start from the bottom and you have a ground layer of sedges usually, and then you work up. So it's not quite as uh, neat and refined as block planting can be. Block planting is could be compared to like a Mondrian uh, painting, or if you're my age and used to watch the Partridge family when you were little, uh, block planting can look like the Partridge family bus. Uh, so you might want to blur those lines a little bit. But I think my art has influenced that style that I have. And um, also, there's just something about living with art because it, it's almost like that you have a part of the soul of the artist. Uh, which is kind of cool. And I do believe in muses in a general way. And so when you surround yourself with inspiration, when you surround yourself with creativity, it kind of rubs off. It can't help it rubbing off on you. I imagine that is the same for a client that is living with one of your designs too. They have a little piece of your soul and it maybe rubs so. off on them. <laughs> I think so, especially the other photo I sent you with, with the glass that we might talk about later. Yeah. So where can people find inspiration to create a unique garden? Well, I love the word inspiration. I was thinking about this yesterday. You know, basically inspiration means to breathe into. So if you think about some gardens are just a collection of plants. There's no soul. There's no life. They're sort of static instead of dynamic. So when you're inspired and you're breathing life, you're breathing your personality into that space, it really animates the space, gives it its own personality, and then the space kind of kind of comes alive. I think, um, I mean, you can get inspiration from any place. I mean, I've been walking down a sidewalk and I've seen a dandelion come up through a crack and I'm like, I need to build a crevice garden, you know, that kind of thing. So really inspiration is everywhere. Um, in my old garden, I noticed how the lights, uh, the shafts of sunlight kind of pierced the forest canopy and, and would shine on the ground in certain patterns. So I created a whole garden. I called it my light garden and I used chartreuse colored plants in the shade to basically mimic the shafts of light coming through uh, the forest canopy. So in that case, that light inspired me to create something that was sort of an illusion. Um, you know, looking at tree bar, looking at cakes in the restaurant. I mean, there's so many places you can really find inspiration. And I think another point to be made about that is that when you're breathing life, you're breathing yourself, that inspiration into your garden, you need to take your own personality into account um, I wrote a series of articles years ago uh, for a, a website on finding your garden personality. And I talked about the extrovert, the philosopher, the artist, the traveler, and there were some more uh, in addition to that. But I think if you are um, 
an extrovert, you know, you're going to probably want party time going in your garden and you'll use bright colors, that sort of thing. If you're a philosopher, your garden is probably going to be a little bit more minimalistic. You will uh, kind of concentrate on different shapes and forms, how they interact with each other. Um, so there are a lot of, uh, you know, of, of things that you can interject in your garden with design in mind to really make that garden your own, to breathe your own inspiration into that. You can get inspiration from movies. Um, actually, I have a talk I developed called The Power of the Line. And you know how I learned so much about how to use lines and shapes and forms properly in a garden is that I studied the Batmobile from the different movies. The first Batman movie came out in 1940, and it was a Cadillac. The Batmobile was. It looked like um, sort of a gangster car. And then in the 60s, with the whimsical version on TV, it was a kind of a whimsical-looking uh, Batmobile. But in the 90s and 2000s, uh, the, the movies became darker. And so the shapes of the cars became much more angular and more aggressive. So, you know, I learned a lot about garden design from studying Batmobile, which sort of surprises people sometimes. And then the other movie that um, I mentioned in the uh, article on my mountain garden uh, was Mary Poppins. And to me, I had a pivotal point in my design career and my personal life about 15 years ago. I was sitting there on a Saturday night with a bottle of wine watching Mary Poppins. I mean, that's what you do, right? When you're bored on a Saturday. And the part of the movie where Jane and Michael and Mary and Bert jumped into the sidewalk chalk painting and were immersed in an animated world full of uh, really loud sounds and bright primary colors, dancing penguins, carousel horses coming off the carousel uh, to join in a fox hunt. I thought, wow, that is what a garden should be. A place totally immersed, a, total, a totally magical place a place that is really has little resemblance to the outside world. And so that kind of became my mission and my goal and my purpose from that point is to design uh, Mary Poppins gardens. And when I succeed in doing that, you know, it, Mary had this uh, tape measure and it, it said uh, Mary Poppins practically perfect in every way. And so I think that if you can design that magical immersive space full of inspiration, then your garden truly can be uh, practically perfect in every way, just like Mary. <laughs> <laughs> and you, that's awesome. I love that. I, I've heard you say that um, people can learn more about, uh, about a design they're working on from what they don't like than what they do. Can you explain right. that a little more? Sure. So when I started out, this was like, is like a third career for me. And so um, I started looking at house and I started looking at Pinterest and through the garden uh, design photos uh, when I was drinking my coffee and eating my cereal in the mornings. And if I found a picture that I liked, it's like, okay, that's nice. I move on to the next picture. But if I found a picture that I didn't like, some design element that really bothered me, it caused me to stop and think, you know, what bothers me about this design? And so I tell people, I think you really can learn more from designs that you hate or dislike than designs that you love, because it will cause you to stop and question. Um, I think that's really important. One other, one other inspirational type of thing I want to mention is uh, probably... 20 years ago, I was walking through Respiration Hardware, and back then, the, the uh, sort of a powder blue and chocolate brown were like all the bedding was that was those two colors. And I started thinking, you know, that would be perfect. I could just substitute blue spruce and uh, nine bark shrubs with with chocolate foliage and just kind of pull that. So even if you're walking through a department store, uh, you can get inspiration in the bedding department. I mean. There are so many ways to gather inspiration. You just kind of have to have your mind open to possibilities that present themselves pretty much every minute of the day. If your mind is in the right place, I that's that's fantastic. Um, what do you feel sets a great garden apart from most yards? Uh, getting back to what I alluded to earlier, 
uh, I think a great garden is built on four cornerstones. So if you think of a house on a foundation, if you take out one corner of that foundation, the house is going to tilt and slide off. And I think a great garden is firmly built upon the four cornerstones. The first one is art. Uh, second one is magic. Third one is story. And then lastly is horticulture. And they are all equal, but I put horticulture last just to tick off plants people a little bit. <laughs> but um, art, you know, whether you're uh, using actual art in your garden, hopefully not gnomes, because I'm very well known for my hatred of gnomes. But, uh, you know, good art in a garden uh, is important, but also just how you arrange your plants artistically is important. So that's one cornerstone. The second cornerstone of story that I alluded to earlier, you know, every uh, piece of land, every house, every person has a unique story to tell. And so I was thinking one day and thought that garden design is a perfect medium for communicating story or for storytelling. And I think if you tell the story of the land, the land will kind of give back to you uh, in sort of a spiritual way. So you know, you may have a cool piece of property like my mountain property um, in the Christmas tree capital of the world, or you might just have a flat square lot in the middle of a big housing project. But if you have that flat square lot, uh, try to research the story of the land. Maybe it used to be a farm. You know, we did a, a garden one time where um, the houses were kind of uh, mid-century uh, modern, little craftsmen too. But um I found out that that used to be a horse farm. And so I went out and I introduced um, a, um, a water wheel, a, a millstone, and um, I planted some feather grass to kind of look like uh, some sort of crop. And we actually did some espaliered apple trees along the back of the, um, the garage. And it just turned out really nicely. I found some big spheres that were made out of... Um, rusted, recycled uh, whiskey barrel straps. And I thought, well, they look like they could be from farm equipment of some sort. And so I introduced those elements back and in the, uh, we, we created a very special, unique garden in that way. So tell the story of your land, of your house, and your personal story as well. Uh, magic, I think magic is just that flame of excitement, of inspiration, that uh, when a garden really exceeds all of its parts put together. Um, it just kind of takes on that personality, that immersive quality. And then horticulture, most gardens have plants. I've been to one garden in California that had no plants. It was very weird, but uh, typically we have a lot of plants in our garden. And, and, and that's a great way, of course, to introduce life, to introduce animation, color, texture, shapes, and all that. So those are the four cornerstones. Excellent. How much time do you need to spend on a site um, before you start designing? Does, is it days, weeks? Can you, could you ever design a garden for a, a space that you hadn't visit, physically visited? I've done it, and I've never been satisfied with the results. So in a perfect world, you would design after visiting a garden for an entire year because that gives you time to see how the sun shifts through the seasons and, and, and how the plants respond to different variables, how water flows through the property, uh, if you have microclimates, that sort of thing. But in my real world, very few people want to wait a year out uh, to start constructing a garden. So I do several visits. Um, I have this ability that probably is fairly unique Almost always when I walk onto a new property, within five minutes, I have the entire design mapped out in my head. Uh, maybe not every detail, but at least the larger concepts. And um, that's a good way to get people on board if they get excited about that vision. Um, but I do try to go back several times at different times of the day to see how things are working with the light. Um, and then I take a lot of photos and videos also and design from that. So I pretty much stopped designing gardens and I can't um, actually visit. Um, but once I start, started to become a little more popular um, through media, I've had people contact me from France, Germany, Saudi Arabia. Like, I do not know what grows in Saudi Arabia. 
you know, I could do Pacific Northwest probably, but not Saudi Arabia. So I think it's important to become very well acquainted with the land. That makes perfect sense. Is it ever hard to convince uh, clients of, you know, that your vision is the right vision for a garden or, or to get them to see like in their mind's eye, what it is you see in your mind's eye? Sometimes it is because some people just can't visualize things. But um, usually if I am excited about a plan, they get excited. But I do tell them that these are just initial impressions, that if that, if it doesn't fit with how they think and what they're comfortable with, we can do something different. But I also tell them that every design decision I make, I will have from three to 12 reasons as to why I think that's the appropriate decision. And if you would like, I can go through all 12 of them for you. But um, usually people are pretty much on board and they come to us now because they really like our style. So it's not an uphill battle like it used to be. Um, Yeah, people who come to us just kind of like what we do and seek us out, which is a great place to be. That is, that is. And they and they they're sure to be happier with it because they they chose you and they chose you because of how you design. Are yeah. are there some other sources of design inspiration that are particularly useful to you? Um again, I find inspiration pretty much everywhere from the layer cake to the bedding department. I think um I think of creativity as sort of a collective uh, unconscious or an ocean. And I think we can stick our toe in it or we can jump into it. Um, And I think creativity is not limited by form. So like I mentioned, I uh, received some great understanding and inspiration from the Batmobile. Um, I like to look at architecture too. Um, You know, car manufacturers, architects have really mastered um, the art of design in that they can tailor their products to what people want. Um, even, you know, cereal boxes at the grocery store. I mean, they're targeted to a very specific audience, right? And so when you look at architecture that's targeted to people or to car designs or to interior design, I think that if you're surrounding yourself, if you're jumping into that big old ocean of creativity, some of that will rub off on you. Um, cause creativity is not static. It's dynamic. It's always moving. It's, it's, it's alive and, and it's an exciting thing. And the fact that I get to, um, uh, work with it every day, uh, is a real privilege that I have. And I don't take that lightly. It, yeah. That, um, that makes me, when you talk about architecture, it, Reminds me of my previous life. I was a real estate developer. I worked with architects and uh, designers. And there's this great concept, highest and best use, where you're taking a property and you're pitching that this is this is the highest and best use for this property. I feel like that's kind of what you're doing, too. Like you're taking land, you know, blank land or an existing garden and, and making it better. It's a whole lot easier to design a garden from scratch than it is to go into somebody's garden that's been there for 20 years and revamp. We're actually doing that uh, latter thing right now, but you know, this rose bush, for example, it's just not working. It's not healthy. The color's wrong, but you know, uh, cousin Gladys gave it to me on her deathbed. So I have to keep it. And so that's always, uh, a little bit difficult. Can we move Gladys over to someplace else you know, or give her to another cousin or something like that? So, um, yeah, people are interesting. You know, if I could just work with plants and dogs all day, life would be perfect. Sometimes people come up with these unexpected things, but I guess that's what keeps life interesting, too. Absolutely. Any final thoughts for us? Any anything that you'd like to leave us with? Um I think, anything. Yeah, I just think, you know, go out in your garden, see what works, uh, look at it through those four cornerstones, look at it through the four parameters of juxtaposition, and don't be afraid to take chances. And if you just are, are stumped with, with an aspect of design, you know, call a friend or, or call it a garden designer. 
Um, there are some out there that are probably better than others, but, uh, you know, call somebody for another opinion. But some people are so afraid to make decisions that they just don't make any decisions because they're afraid of making the wrong one. And um, you know what? Most of what you're going to do, if it doesn't work out, if it doesn't please you, you could probably rip it out and do something different. Uh, you'll probably save money past a certain point in hiring a designer if you're kind of in that uh, in, in that bucket. But, um, you know, don't be afraid to try things. Um, I was told when I used to grow orchids um, years ago, uh, you know, the thing that separates you from really good growers is you haven't killed enough plants yet. And I think that's true in, in outdoor gardening as well. We're so afraid to kill something or we try to, uh, hang on and nurture something back to health. And I'm at the stage of my life, if it's not looking good, if it's, you know, half dead, we'll pull it out and plant something better. But my rule is if I kill something three times, I won't plant it again. Uh, and so far, a very few things I've killed three times, maybe twice, but not three times. So don't be afraid of mistakes. Don't be afraid of killing things. And sometimes you have to be ruthless. If it's not worth it, working for you, just pull it out and do something different. So take chances and look for ways to to breed that inspiration, your personality into the garden. And, and that will, again, cause it to not be static, but living and dynamic and magical. Excellent. Well, thank you so very much for joining us, folks. Uh, you can find the show notes online at findgardening.com. Go to the podcast tab. Jay has given us some photos. We'll, we'll add some photos from uh, the articles that we've, that we've been mentioning. And um, you can find links to Jay's articles there as well. Thanks, thanks again, Jay. And, uh, and we will see you in the garden. It was a pleasure. Sounds good. Thank you, Carol.